I'm gonna do some steaming and organizing and I'm gonna do chatty work with me uh, because I have to leave my house for a week and so I'm gonna set the timer for approximately 45 minutes. Five, four, three, two, one. I don't know why I count down when this isn't gonna be exact, but we try our best. So the topic of today's video, the main topic is gonna to be um, Poshmark promoted listings. What I think, what I'm planning on doing, um, do I think it's good for sellers? And also I'll kind of oh, do an overview of my eBay promoted, what I do, what I tested out, um, and what is currently working for me. And then I'll answer some random questions that I have from random videos. So, all right. I also have this window open because I thought my last chatty work with me was going to be the last worn one, but here we are. I'm leaving my house this week because they are installing my air conditioner. And, um, so I'm trying to get a couple videos done before I leave town so they can get that done. So this should really be the last toasty video. Um, okay. So what do I want to do? I want to organize this, um, and this and this. It's a hot mess. All right, so uh, the very first thing, Poshmark promoted listings. I haven't heard what other people think about it. I haven't watched any videos on it. Um, a couple weeks ago, I got the little notification in the Poshmark app that said, do you wanna join the beta? I'm not gonna join a beta. I don't have time to give feedback, to deal with the stuff. But when I saw it, I was like, finally. <laughs> Finally, um, I really think that this should have happened a long time ago. Um, I remember hearing when I first, not my, when I first joined Poshmark, but probably my first year, one of my old reselling friends went to Poshfest and came back and we were chatting about what they had said and all of that. And basically they said that um, the one of the, the main people, I think it was the CEO at the time, um, said he didn't want to, he wanted a platform that was fair for everyone. So if you just joined the app yesterday versus if you'd been on the app for four years, that you have the same chance of selling and they didn't want anyone to have any special treatment for being, and I think, you know, I've said this before, I think Poshmark was really trying to do things different than eBay. So they weren't just a copy of eBay, but eBay has done things wrong and right and been in the game a lot longer. And you know, I think Poshmark already has a different feel and vibe, but business-wise, business sense, and since these companies are trying to make money, it makes sense why Promoted exists. And you don't have to agree with it, you don't have to like it, but I never understood why they wanted things to be fair. Life isn't fair, <laughs> I've accepted this, it's hard, it's a hard pill to swallow at times, but you know, it's just one of those things that I, I think if someone wants to join the Poshmark app and they're new and they don't want to have a bot, they don't want to pay promoted, they don't want to, like there are all different levels of things that you can do to maximize your return on these apps. Like you could hire an employee, you could have someone source for you and pay them, you could do you could pay a premium to have wholesale sent to you so you can churn out more. Like every one of us is deciding what we want to pay for and what makes sense for us. And Poshmark, you know, wanting to be fair just didn't really make sense for them and their profit. And also some of us who maybe we don't, I don't know. I mean, I would rather spend $2 and have a $20 sale in the next month then not pay that $2 and have that $20 item sit for another year. And promoted isn't a guarantee that things are gonna sell, but it is, and I, I haven't done the beta test, so, but it is going to hopefully put your items in front of people more often. And so hopefully your chances of selling those items will be better. In fact, I did write down or just copy what the Poshmark app says when you Google this um, and currently it's a beta so it's being tested but it says um, Poshmark closet promoted closet helps sellers increase visibility of their listings which it should your pay that's what you're paying for this is a paid marketing tool that allows listings in a seller's closet to be eligible for promotion to shoppers on Poshmark 
Uh, promoted closet will promote listings in a seller's closet during each campaign, which will last for seven days. Only available listings in your closet are eligible for promotion. So if you have something that's, um, you know, sold or marked as not for sale, those obviously won't be promoted. Um, it's in a closet beta trial and it can only be accessed via the web at the moment. So let, leave me a comment below if you're in the beta test and what you think of it so far. I'm sure maybe they had you sign something where you can't talk about it, which is totally fine. But, um, but yeah, so I think that, you know, it's, if someone wants to go out there and, you know, not pay a dime and do everything manually, that's fine. They can still use the site. It's just if someone does want to give up a little bit more money and potentially have more visibility on their listings, then that's their decision that they have the right to make. And Poshmark will probably benefit because they're getting more fees in a sense. So I personally think it's long overdue. Um, I think that, do I want, yeah, no. Do you have a little spot? I think you need. Um, so, you know, I personally will do it depending on, you know, what the stipulations are, like how much does it cost? You know, currently Poshmark is the, one of the most expensive platforms as far as fees. Now, you know, one of the things you're getting for that is you are getting the fact that they're dealing with all of your shipping hassle. So like if something goes missing, you're not the one reaching out to USPS, like you maybe have to on eBay. Um, or if, you know, if you don't want to respond to someone and they have a problem, Poshmark's the one doing the customer service. So you are paying a higher fee, but they are doing a little bit more versus eBay. You're kind of on your own. Oh my gosh. This is why I shouldn't buy things like this, this dress, because it's been sitting up here for two months and I just don't want to photograph it because it won't fit on the mannequin. It's horrendous. I'm going to force myself. I'm doing a challenge with some friends soon. So I'm trying to get my rack ready of stuff that I want to do for that challenge. And I'm going to keep that on the rack so I actually get it done. So I will 100% do po pro promoted Poshmark if it's reasonable. Um, you know, the whole seven days thing, I don't know. I mean, that seems a little short and it's something that I think would be worth testing. Now, I will say I did a test on eBay recently and um, not recently. It was, it was for a couple months. It was earlier this year. And I was watching someone who's a hard good seller and they were saying that they had gone up on their promoted rate. So on eBay, you can do, you can set a rate. So maybe you just want to do promoted at 2% or do promoted at 5% or you choose the one they recommend, which is usually for use clothing somewhere between like eight and 10%. Um, so you have the right to kind of finagle it how you want, which I've always loved about eBay. Like there's just a lot of options. So you can choose what, what you think is best for you, or you can try different things. But I did a, an experiment. It wasn't a true AB test because there's really, I didn't know of any way that would be accurate. Um, but basically for a couple months, I was promoting at, uh, what was it? 2% over their recommended. So if, if eBay and, and recommended for items on eBay, each individual item is recommended different rates. So let's say the item was recommended at 9.6%, I would go in 2% over. And the concept there was, okay, if it gets me more visibility and more people, more sales happen, I'd be happy to pay just a little bit more. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there that just, they think all of these companies, you know, charge too much. I don't know. I personally don't think, am I still recording? We've got to check this every once in a while because um, I personally think that what they're doing is creating a platform and they're, they're doing marketing to find buyers, to find sellers, and to hopefully pair up those two people. And so of course they're going to take a percentage of money and they're constantly trying to do updates and they have large teams. And I don't really think any of the fees are unreasonable my personal take. I think what's hard is let's say eBay, if the fees go up, then you have someone who was selling 20 years ago and they're like, man, it feels like every couple years my fees are going up or man, they're adding this promoted and this new promoted thing. And it's like, you could go a little wild with, with listing with fees. And I get that that is frustrating when things change, but I also am just like, 
costs change, demand changes. I don't know. Um, and I also think like if you don't like a platform and their fees, you can sell on another platform or you can try and generate business on your own. There's someone, I don't know her very well, but there's someone who um, I follow on Instagram and she primarily sells on Instagram. So she doesn't pay any fees. And she does, she was doing lives, kind of lives or shop my stories type of thing um, a long time ago, like way before, you know, whatnot and um, posh lives and all that stuff. And she, I, I feel like, um, you know, she generates her own business. She markets herself on Instagram to get more followers that actually want to buy and shop her stories. Um, you know, I think that if you want to do that, then you don't have to pay the fees, but that requires time and energy and, you know, or maybe you do kind of a dual thing. Maybe you want to try marketing on your own and kind of do some of that on your own. Um, but you also want to use some platforms and your average fees that you pay per item is less because you are selling somewhat direct, um, to some people and that minimizes some of the fees. It, like total. Just a quick pause for the sponsor of today's video, which is Skillshare. I've been using Skillshare for the last couple of years. They've actually sponsored me before. And that's when I was introduced to how incredibly helpful that platform is for me because I have so many of my own small businesses as a self-employed person and it's all self-taught. So this platform has really been a game changer. Every time I want to go learn something, it's my go-to platform. A few of the things that I'm currently learning on Skillshare is a lot around real estate photography and filming because that's kind of its own little beast and different than my other YouTube content. I also do yoga classes on Skillshare because I stopped going to my local yoga studio and I just really enjoy the peaceful, calming, easy classes that they have on Skillshare. And I do a lot of product productivity courses. And that's just because I'm trying to juggle a lot and manage a lot with very limited time, it feels like. The class I'm currently working on today is called Productivity for Creators. It's around systems, organization, and workflow, and it's created by Ali Abdal, and I really like a lot of his productivity classes. You may know Skillshare for classes in photography, film, video editing, and illustration, but did you know that Skillshare actually has hundreds of career-focused classes too? So for me, having a lot of real estate classes has been really helpful because that is kind of my more recent career path that is complementary to my reselling and YouTube journey as well. Traditional work and jobs are not one size fits all. So one of the things that I love is I'm designing the career to fit me as opposed to trying to fit into a specific career. So if you haven't tried Skillshare yet, I highly recommend it. The first thousand people to use the link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. And I'll definitely be linking that below in case you haven't signed up already. I just love the fact that you can go on, explore, try it on your own and see how much you can benefit from it too. Big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring another video and providing amazing content that's helping me thrive in my new real estate career and also continue to learn for my reselling and YouTube businesses. So I don't know. I don't think, I don't complain about thrift store prices or marketplace price, uh, fees because like thrift store prices in LA, they could be absurd at times, but it's usually just certain items. It's usually items I don't want. Even if it's an item that maybe I want, like it's a Lulu item, Lulu, um, Lululemon item that's maybe marked at $25 for a tank top. And I wouldn't even be able to get that online, but it's cute. Maybe it's a good size. And I'm like, man, why did they mark this at $25? Well, there's other stuff at that store I can probably find. And I also know the cost of rent, the cost of employees. California minimum wage is like $17 or $16.50 or something absurd right now. So, I mean, all of these, whether they're nonprofits or if they are paying employees and they have to pay rent, like, and those things keep going up, then our prices are going to go up. So I've never really understood. I also understand that like if a store is outrageously pricing things, which there's some mom and pops in mom and pop stores in, um, in which one is that? There's some mom and pop stores in LA that are by far the highest priced, highest marked up. And I just won't even go to them, you know, but I don't like shame them. I don't like, Hey, if that's your business model and you guys are generating sales and it works for you, like, so be it. I'm not going to shop here. Cause I can't, I can't get a good flip off of it, but I'm not bitter about it. You know, same with fees. Like, 
you know, Posh or eBay rolled out that promoted advanced or something is what they call it. And so they already had promoted listings and then they rolled out this new promoted thing. And I, I watched someone talk about it on a video and I'm like, you know, I, I can't do everything on these platforms. I'm not going to try everything. Um, and I'm already promoting to a degree and maybe this new promoted thing is better, but I just don't have the bandwidth in all reality to do everything and it, that's okay. So I think if someone is like me and, you know, thinks that, you know, Poshmark promoted might be a good option, you know, I'll be there with you trying it out and hopefully it can produce some sales. And I, and I don't know, the reason I don't think it's easy to really know if something's effective is if, if the months, if different months you're doing different sales. So like maybe January and February are slow months for you. They are for me. I know that. Um, if I do a test in January, February and I'm comparing it to March and April, which my sales tend to start picking up during that time, then it's, it's not, it's not an even comparison. And so like, but even if you waited until the next year, um, to, to run a test at the exact same months, well, you might have different inventory or maybe you do half your closet promoted or store promoted January, February, and you don't do half, like half of it isn't, that's still not a true test because it's not equal items. So there's, it's really hard when people say like, I, you know, like I'm saying right now, I did a test and it, the, Increasing the amount did not really produce any additional sales for me. It's not a 100% clear test. Now for me, it was something worth trying. I didn't see huge changes in sales um, and I was paying more in higher promoted fees. And so I stopped doing that and now I'm down to 5% at everything. Um, and that's what I currently do on eBay. But for me, it was worth trying because I had heard someone who was going up to like 17 to 20% per item. And keep in mind, at least with eBay, I don't know what it's going to be like on Poshmark, but when you promote things, you're only paying promoted if the person ever clicked on one of your promoted links. If they found your organic link, you're not paying promoted on everything. So, um, and it on eBay, at least it will tell you when someone actually got it from promoted. And currently I would say probably about half my sales on eBay are promoted. And right now my rate is 5% and I'm okay with that. That's kind of like, an extra two and a half percent overall on eBay and eBay already has, I don't know. So for me, I am a okay to try something. If I like, I'm willing to pay to play and not everyone is, and that's okay. Um, but me personally, I have a lot of inventory. I love, there is a report on eBay where you can see how much you spent on these promoted fees and how much, in total sales you got. And again, it's like, I would love to pay two or $3 and have something sell for 20 to 25 and, you know, have more visibility on that instead of having that maybe wait another six to 12 months to sell or longer. So, and also promoted one thing, like I just listed something the other day. What was it? It was something a little more unusual. And I decided not to promote it. And I've been promoting everything. Like I used to, last year, I used to promote everything about a month after it was listed. Because my mentality was like, well, maybe they'll find it organically and I won't have to pay promoted. Then I just started, like, I did my test earlier this year. And then I just started promoting everything right when I was listing it for the first time. And um, so I, but every once in a while I have something that's kind of unique. And I will basically choose not to promote it in the beginning because there's just not that much competition. So it like maybe something unique vintage, or maybe it's something that's like not one of a kind, but there just aren't that much listed. And you can kind of get a sense of what those items are when you go to look up comps, at least for me, when I go to look up comps to list stuff, I can kind of see like, oh, there's none available, you know? So it's like, why would I promote that if there's none available? If someone searches, I'm probably gonna be the top of the search. Um, if they're searching for that item. So there are definitely times when, you know, but most of my stuff these days, I promote, I promote at 5%. Um, I know some people promote at 2% or 10% or they do the recommended. I did the recommended last year. And again, I didn't, I didn't see, 
yeah so i mean certain items let's say you have a loft top and that top is um there's a hundred out there listed well if you list at two percent and the recommended is eleven percent well why even pay the two percent at that point <laughs> like it might get you on the list from you know the 50 line to the 40 line but if you want to get up to the top five, you're going to have to pay probably over their recommended because you have to compete. Like it's just supply and demand. And also who else is paying what promoted fees? So I think having some promoted on eBay seems to help for me. Um, like I said, about half my sales right now, 40 to 50%, I can see that they sold via promoted on eBay. And, um, you know, I'm glad those things sell. Now they could sell on their own without being promoted, you just don't know how much longer it would have taken or if that person would have continued to scroll down. Like for me, I also think of, well, I have, I try to price reasonably. Obviously I miss the mark sometimes. Sometimes I accidentally overprice or I really like an item. So I, I overprice it because I think it's worth more than it is. But for the most part, I try to list either the average or on the lower end of pricing. So like, you know, um, this, uh, Hugo Boss jacket that I'm going to list at some point in the near future. That for me is if there's 10 of them listed identical or even similar, but like, you know, if I can find identical, that's great. If there's 10 of them listed, I'm going to sort by uh, size. If there's two mediums listed and this is a medium or whatever it is, and I'm going to probably try and be lower than the other two, just, just by a dollar. <laughs> Like not much, but I do in case someone is sorting low to high, which is how I shop, which is something I do in case someone is doing that, I would rather be the lowest, even if it's just by a dollar. Um, and at that point, you know, some people say, well, I model my pictures. So I ask for more or I provide measurements or I provide a lot of photos and a lot of details. So I think there's more value in that. Um, I think, you know, to each their own, you know, you can price however you want, but for me, if I can find the exact item, exact size, and there's two or three listed or more, I'm always going to sort and I'm always, unless there, it's flawed, unless the low priced item is flawed, if they're all in decent condition based off of what the seller is saying, I want to be just like right under. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I need to count how many hangers I have on this rack. Um, and I am just going to list this junk. Why do I pick up this stuff? Like, I don't want to see this. I don't want to photograph this. And this has been on my rack for a couple months. It's also from the bins and probably has a stain somewhere. <sighs> I'm, not, I'm not dealing with it this week. <laughs> I just don't have the energy. It'll go in my security pile, <laughs> which is like when times are desperate, that's that pile. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how I feel about promoted on Poshmark, what I've been doing promoted on eBay. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm excited to hear what some of you guys leave in the comments because we all, that's, that is the great thing about reselling. You can cherry pick different things. You can try different things. You know, I mean, an example is, is I have so many friends who love whatnot, not close friends, but like people I have respect for. And, um, they love whatnot and, and they'll every once in a while say like, you know, you could really make a lot of money. And, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm focusing my energy on real estate where I can also make a lot of money and I'm enjoying reselling how it is. And I'm not afraid to try something new. Like I'm not a, afraid to try promoted listings on Poshmark because it's not much energy and I still can kind of do what, what makes me happy. But if someone else wants to do something or doesn't want to do something, they have that right. And I just love that about reselling is like, you can buy what you want. You can price how you want. You can sell on whatever platform you want. You can try new things. You don't have to try new things. Like we just, it's not a one size fits all. And that's what I appreciate. So, all right, that is all I'm going to talk about with that. I feel like I need a sip of water. Not water, sparkling, cherry flavor, cherry bubbly. Um... All right, so, so uh, these are just some random comments or questions I've gotten on various videos recently. Someone, my last video, I showed an angle 
where I put the camera over here and it was shooting back this way. And someone said, we've never seen this angle of your home. It would be nice to have a house tour. I've gotten that question a few times. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably see more of my house in general. But um, I, there's not much to see. <laughs> there really isn't. Uh, I mean, I have an A-frame and I'm up in a loft. My downstairs, there's two bedrooms and one bathroom, a kitchen, living room, dining room, sunroom. Um, so I, it's not a very big house. The one room I won't really ever show, I just, there was a time where I was, I don't know if it was that I was gonna, I think I was gonna like sort through my closet and film a video of me like going through my closet. This was a long time ago, like four years ago. And I remember being in my room going, this is the, I just need a space where I'm not tempted to pick up a camera, where I don't ever have that, that feeling like I want to pick up a camera. And so I made my personal bedroom off limits for all social media, um, Instagram, YouTube, everything. Because I, I also feel like you show so much of your life. Like I just want to say, and it's not like anything's wrong with my bedroom. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, but I feel like I just need a space that is camera free. Um, so that's the only room I haven't shown in any way, shape or form. And everything else I've shown in videos or Instagram, just not in a full on tour. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll add it at the end of a chatty work with me at some point. I think also part of it is like, it's kind of a work in progress. And I know every home is and it kind of forever will be, but like the walls that are still brown, I'm hoping to get those painted. And that was on my list to do this year. It depends on how many homes, how many more homes I sell this year, but um, it's after my roof is done. Um, and that'll be done in hopefully in the next couple months. So if I can sell another couple houses this year, pay money to taxes into my 401k and all of that stuff, maybe then I'll get to where I finish all the painting, not me painting, but someone else. Um, but I don't know, like I, I, I'm not ashamed of any of it. It's just, it's a work in progress. Um, so yeah, but maybe at the end of one chatty work with me, I will do like a informal tour, like a walk around so you can kind of see the layout. But I mean, it were, it's a, it's a great house for me. Again, I, I mean, I show a lot of houses and I get a lot of feedback from people on things they like and things they don't like. And man, sometimes people are super picky and sometimes people are not picky at all. I was picky on wanting a unique house. So I wanted character. Um, that was my picky miss. Like I didn't want a basic box, nothing wrong with basic boxes. Um, they make, they're practical. They make a lot of sense. Um, but because I didn't have like this loft is not practical. If you had kids, for example, they could fall off the railing for what I would assume. Um, it's also not like really usable space in like a bedroom way. You could maybe turn it into one or something like that. But for the most part, this house, it's perfect for me. But I also came from, where do I want to go with this? I also came from a very small studio in San Francisco that like, you know, this is living the dream for me because I didn't even have a washer and dryer in my unit. I, my entire adult life until I moved here. So like my place in San, my last place in San Francisco, and I was at that apartment for nine years, that, that place, I had a, I was on the third floor no elevator, old building, like 1920 something. Um, so I, every time I had to like bring groceries, I had to like carry them up the stairs or move anything up there, like carry them up, up the stairs. I don't know why I'm doing like a whatever. Um, but it was a lot of stairs and the laundry was in our basement and it was shared with all the units. And I think we had two washers and two dryers and it was coin operated. So I, for, you know, nine, the last nine years before I moved here, I would have to go down from the third floor all the way down to the basement, carry my laundry up and down. And then you would have those moments where you um, put your laundry in and you don't get to it quick enough and you don't stay down there and someone else moves your laundry and now you have to like rewash it. It's a whole thing. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Some people have never enjoyed, you know, life without washers and dryers. Like maybe you went from your parents' house and right into a house where you had a washer dryer or apartment or something. Um, but many of us, especially if you did college, you've enjoyed the life of laundry mats or shared laundry spaces. And so for me moving here, 
my washer dryer's in my bathroom, not weird to me at all. It was the most exciting thing in my life. Like I still, it's a stack, it's a stackable, so it's not very big. Oh, this was really cute. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, every day I do laundry, I'm like, oh my gosh, I spent 20 years never having my own laundry. So like every day I do laundry, I, I'm so excited. I could just, it's in my own house. So, um, okay. That wasn't, I mean, that was not reselling related, but, um, there is a service that will remove sold listings. So someone left a comment on one of my videos, um, where I was talking about, I don't remember which one it was anyways, but they said that there is a service out there that will remove sold listings. I have heard about this and I'm going to try it. So my currently my cross listing and, um, sharing a uh, service that I pay for. I paid for a year and then I got a year free from doing some old sponsorships. I haven't done any with them in a while. Um, but that ends, I think June or July. And when that ends, instead of renewing with them, I thought, well, I will, I'll just try something new. Like why not? Um, so that's the plan is I, I did hear from a friend of mine um, I was at the bins with her, I don't know, six months ago. And she was telling me about this, uh, platform, this program that does cross listing, does sharing, um, does everything like those typical services do, but it also will remove solds. Now the one I was using, they were trying to get to that point. Part of the problem why I don't think many of them can do it is because so many of them, like the one I use, which is called prime lister, no complaints. I mean, it, it, it's the one I preferred up till now. Like it's, it's the one I preferred the most. They did at one point say they were going to have this sold removal thing, auto removal thing. And I was so excited, like, because that would have been a complete game changer for me. Um, but I think the reason why they were hitting these walls, I think they're still working on it, but like why it's hard for them is because they have so many platforms. So they have eBay, Mercari, Poshmark, uh, Shopify, um, the list goes on Facebook marketplace. They have, you know, eight to 10 different platforms. And so let's say you cross list on five of them and they have to have a way to auto remove on each of those platforms. And each platform probably has different coding that would make that possible. And I would imagine that some of them make it impossible, which is why some of these cross listing services don't offer the auto removal because of that reason. So um, let me count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Um, yeah, that's not bad. All right. So I'll have to pull from my rockets for some things, but so anyways, um, I am going to try this other one to see how it compares because again, like if I have the chance before renewing with prime lister, if I choose to renew with them, um, I may as well try something else and see if it's better or see if it works better for me and auto removal, I think would be hands down the best thing. Any of these platform, um, cross listing services can do. Um, okay. So, oh my gosh. My mom is so funny. <laughs> she, <laughs> she dropped off. I can see outside to my front gate and she dropped off a dog crate. I have to go stay with other family and I've got the two dogs and my dog Luna is well-trained, but the puppy is still not potty trained. So, and he's being crate trained, but Luna, I don't want her roaming my family member's house and she's not destructive in any way, but it's someone else's house. So I, told my mom, I was like, oh, you have an extra crate. Can I borrow it? Well, I saw my mom a couple days ago and she forgot to bring it up. So I think she, she just brought it up and dropped it off at my front gate. <laughs> she doesn't live that close, but I'm sure she's out thrifting today or something. All right. What else is there? Um, so sometimes I got a couple comments recently where someone was saying that they lived in LA and, um, you know, would I go thrifting with them? And I always, you know, like it's, I know what that feels like. I watched someone on um, YouTube 
there were two people I watched pretty religiously. Neither of them on, are on YouTube anymore when I first started. And I remember watching them going, oh my gosh, I would love to have coffee with her. I feel like we could be friends. And uh, like they don't live anywhere near me, so it wasn't. But I always, anyways, one of them I did end up meeting at a reselling event. I think it was eBay Open. And we didn't click. I don't think she was interested <laughs> in like getting to know me, which is fine. I didn't know at the time that like she's probably overwhelmed by how many people, you know, want to get to know her and be friends with her. Um, but I, I feel bad because it's like there are probably so many people that watch this channel that we would be friends. Like if, if you lived near me or if I got to know you, like I really genuinely feel that way in a weird way, even if I don't know who you are. Um, but it's, it's just not possible for me. And I think the hard thing with LA is when I go down to thrift, it's like if I have, let's say, I'm only gonna be there seven hours because it takes me two hours or two and a half hours depending on how far in LA I'm going, like which area of LA. Um, you know, so it's, it's a solid four to five hours of me driving in a day. And then let's say I wanna thrift for six to seven hours and then I'm gonna have a lunch break. I need to maximize my time thrifting. And if I, I have tried to meet up with some friends and it's like, sometimes it'll be someone who um, is also on YouTube and I'll occasionally like meet up with them cause they're in town or something. But I think what's really hard is if I, it's, it's just um, even just like planning, you know, like then I feel the stress of trying to get somewhere on time. And what if I don't want to stay at that store for a long time? Maybe I don't want to share where my favorite stores are. So then I'm meeting at a store. Maybe that won't be that great. Um, so I will say this. I, I know the feeling of wanting thrift buddies. I think thrift buddies are the best as a reseller. And I have had my times where I've had thrift buddies and it's been like, it makes the job so fun. Um, because you can meet at the bins or you can meet at thrift stores and you can have someone to talk to. And like my mom's my OG thrift buddy, um, shout out to mom, but like we have our, we have our system, you know, like she'll go off in different parts of the store. I'll have my headphones in, but then every once in a while she'll be near me and it will like chat while we're looking through things. Um, so, you know, I think, um, if you are looking for thrift buddies, like maybe you're new to the game and you just would rather have a social time thrifting, um, I think the bins is the best place to meet people, but it's also the hard, it's, I don't know if I agree with my own statement. I think that um, the bins is full of resellers and everyone kind of knows it. The employees know it, we all know it. It's just, it's pretty much full of resellers. So your chances of meeting another reseller are pretty strong there. Uh, but, also sometimes it can get clicky. I don't know. I mean, I haven't really, I'm trying to think of like how many, how I've met people. <laughs> sometimes I meet people that actually do follow me and um, not very often. It happened a couple times where I've met some people who do follow me and they, they ended up becoming friends and I don't talk to them all, that all the time and I don't meet up with them all the time, but I have gone thrifting with them a couple different times. Um, I'm trying to think of how I've met. I don't know. I feel like, okay, this goes against what I do. I put in headphones and I just want to zone out, like zone into what I'm doing and just kind of block out the music and the people and the noise. If you don't have headphones in, you probably are going to be more inclined to strike up a conversation with someone. I mean, it's kind of like real life. If you go to a restaurant and you sit at a bar, um, and there's some restaurants in LA that kind of have more, like you can sit down and eat, but it's like a bar. And if I'm sitting there on my phone, I'm probably not going to focus or try and talk to people and like mingle. But if I put my phone down and just I'm a little bit more open to conversation coming in or even striking up conversation, I feel like I meet more people that way. And that's one of my favorite things about going to LA to thrift is I will usually go to one of those places and I meet new people and I have great conversations. And it's really important for me because I live in, you know, kind of a rural area where I don't mingle a lot. Although this weekend I did hang out every single night, three nights in a row with different friends. So I had a very social weekend, but that's not usually the case. Anyways, I feel like it's the same with their stores or the bins. It, especially at the bins. Like if you happen to like see someone and they're kind of next to you, <laughs> it's not like you're stalking them, but if you have earphones in, they're probably like, they're probably not going to say anything to you. And you might not say anything because you don't hear it. But if you don't have your earbuds in 
and they're grabbing something, you could just say like, oh my gosh, that's a super cute print or something like that. And it kind of strikes up the conversation. And I don't know, I've met so many nice people at the bins. And I, now that I think about it, I have met a couple people that I started following on social media because I, I mingled with them in that same way. And these days I'm, I don't know. <laughs> these days, I mean, my, 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 the way I meet people is slightly different, but I do think m having thrift buddies is one of the best things. And meeting them is just like meeting new friends in real life. It can be hard, but if you just keep going, especially if you go to the same places, you might start recognizing the same faces and you can then just say to someone like, I feel like I've seen you here, you here before. And you, I mean, that's maybe in like a hush hush way, like, oh, are you a reseller? And then they are, and then you're like, oh, okay, where else do you like to thrift? And you know, they don't have to like tell you their favorites, but you know, oh, I like to thrift in this area or this, these sto stores or something like that. And oh, well maybe if you want to thrift sometime, like, let me know. I, you know, I'm always down for kind of a thrift buddy situation. So I don't know. Meeting new people is hard, but if you get some thrift buddies, I think it makes the job pretty great. All right. Seven more minutes on my timer. Um, okay. So accepting low offers. So someone basically left a comment that they got all, all these low offers. They were ready to give up and I get these, this, this stuff pretty often. What do I want to do? I think I want to do some steaming. Um, I get these comments pretty often. And I, I will say this, no one likes a lowball offer. I've done different things in the past. Like there were many years, I just declined anything under 50%. Now it just depends on the item. If it's been sitting in my closet for four years and I get a lowball offer, Courtney, maybe it's time to take that lowball offer. Maybe you, this is the best you can do. Um, I have a friend who uh, posted on Instagram that they got an offer the same day they listed something. And it was a reasonable offer, like an offer I would have hands down accepted in a heartbeat. But they decided to counter. And the person accepted the counter. And I'm like, but counter like, you know, only a few dollars off or something. And I'm sitting there going, man, what if that person didn't accept your counter and you lost that sale? And that was the best offer you were going to get in a year. Um, so I'm not, a, I'm not a huge advocate of countering unless I have to. And it's not that I accept everything. <sighs> I'm stepping on this. It's not that I accept everything. It's just, I do try to look at big picture. You know, was this just listed this week? Maybe I'm not gonna accept a 50% off offer, but maybe I'm going to relook at comps if it's been listed for over six months type of thing. And maybe be a little bit more, not so harsh with my thoughts. Low offers are part of the territory. Um, I think the reason why some people do it is because some people accept them. <laughs> I think I said this on one of my videos. I knew someone at the bins, they priced high everything and they always accepted the first offer. It didn't matter what it was. If it was 80% off their asking price, they accepted it. That was their strategy. Now they always listed really high. So they always were going to make a profit on everything, but that was their strategy. So people send the offers because some people accept them. And, uh, you know, so I personally, I think it's annoying, you know, for sure, for sure. Um, but sometimes the first offer is going to be the best or close to the best. And I can't tell you how many times I've donated something and I'm like, oh, I remember when I got an offer on this and man, that first week and I declined it. And now I'm donating the item and not making any money off of it. Cause I didn't, I didn't accept or even, you know, and it's hard. I mean, there's no exact science with it. I do try to accept more offers and I do try and counter these days. Um, and if it's so outrageous, like it's a really great item and it's got 50 million watchers and likers and someone sends me a $10 offer on a $100 item, I may not even respond. Like it's just a waste of my time to even, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to care too much. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard because we work really hard. And, um, so I get it. I totally get it. Um, okay. How do I decide to list under what brand if it's a collab? So they had an example. I was in the video, I, I was sharing a CP Shades and Free People collab. And they were asking, how do I, how do I pick which brand? Or do I like list both of them? So do I actually do a manual brand, like type in the collab? So here's one thing I will say. I never, ever will write in my own stuff. Unless it's really not an option. Like unless it's an obscure brand, and it's really not an option. Like for example, sometimes uh, an item will be a, a medium slash large 
I never write medium slash large. Oh, I need that. Um, I will always write <laughs> random bug. My mom got this stuff and she got it and it's valuable online. So she gave it to me to list, which sometimes she does, but she put it in a princess Diana bag. Where did you get this mom? Um, <laughs> so anyways, I will always pick usually the size that it's most accurate to. So like if it's a medium slash large and it easily fits a large, I'm going to write it, list it under large, but I'm going to write, this is a, you know, in the description, this is a medium large, but it easily fits a large, or maybe it's really small and it really doesn't, in my opinion, it would fit better for a medium than I would choose the medium with the brands. I usually pick the higher brand. So like if it's a free people, CP shades collab, I'll list it under CP shades because those typically do better for me, but it's still searchable. If someone types free, free people, CP shades, um, it's a tricky situation and some people will type in the whole thing. The reason I don't do the size to be exact, like medium slash large is because I don't think it's searchable if they're filtering by a size it will not show, it won't populate there if you don't choose the same size, the, the size that Poshmark or eBay or what, whatever platform has, at least to my knowledge. So I would rather pick the best option that the platform allows. And yeah. All right. Oh, I need some more water. We'll just steam a couple since I have to take a couple photos today anyway. Um, so yeah, which actually we're out of time. So Let's go check on the dogs because they're sitting outside probably causing trouble. Um, okay, so dogs are healthy. They're doing great. Come here, bud. Uh, causing trouble. Uh, so really no update with them other than, you know, he still needs training. Um, he's jumping a lot, so we're working on that. Um, but yeah, things are good. Um, what other personal things? So yeah, so I just mentioned up there that I had a very social weekend. So I had planned to do a happy hour slash dinner with a few girlfriends. We do, we meet up like every couple months and, um, I know, can you just, can you sit right back to back here? Not on, not on, not on me. Don't bite me. Um, so every couple months I'll just, you know, send them a message. Hey, anyone want to meet up for, you know, a glass of wine, some food, and so anyways, that was planned for Friday night. And so I was looking forward to that. And um, so it was fun conversation. Anyways, that same day, I think one of my friends who I've gone camping with a couple times, who is who lives down in Long Beach, but comes up here occasionally to do some art projects, um, like paid art projects. That's what he does. But um, he hit me up and said he was working on a project here. Hey, can you not hit the, I know, can you, I know you're just a puppy. Um, so he hit me up to say he was up here and that he was starting to get bored. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'll be around this weekend. Like part of it, feel free. So anyways, he ended up coming over. We played cards, caught up and that was Saturday night. And then Sunday I had a friend who, um, I ended up going over to her house and, we sat, like it was kind of impromptu, unexpected, but we sat there and chatted and her husband like brought out, you know, a whole like cheese plate and she had just baked some sourdough bread. And so we were chowing down on that and they have some animals. And um, so she had, at one point, she had two goats when she first moved here. And a year ago, approximately a year ago, the two goats were attacked by a bear. One of them didn't make it. And so then the fish and wildlife came out and I feel like I've talked about this at some point, but, um, fish and wildlife came out and they're like, you really need to wrap your fence with some, um, like electrocuting wires. And so they did that. They, they lost the one goat really sad, tried to wrap the fence, try to, you know, and also started talking to people in the community who have animals and deal with, you know, the wildlife as well. And so they decided to get another goat because the one goat would be lonely. Like, I guess they just need friends. So she, instead of getting one goat, she got three. I don't know how it happened. So she had four goats. At the same time as getting one of the goats, it also came with a pig. And so she has four goats, a pig, two ducks, and then her two indoor dogs, like two dogs that are like, you know, my dogs. 
And so uh, a couple weeks ago, she, apparently they woke up and a mountain lion scaled the fence that was all wired, scaled it, and she lost three goats. So she was down to one. Now the one that is remaining is friends with the pig. So that they're like, we're done. Like we're not getting any more. The goat has its friend. And, but yeah, so really sad um, because they're trying to do everything right. And so then they decide to get two, is it Bernese mountain dogs that are the guard dogs? Anyways, big fluffy white dogs. Oh my gosh. You are just a puppy that uses your mouth for everything everything. He is playing so well with Luna. There are times where she's like a little bit too grumpy and he doesn't, he doesn't pick up on that. Right. But you are, a, you're, you are getting chunky, right? You got a little belly, which is good. Not a bad belly, but a healthy belly, right? You're not so skinny. Um, so anyways, she got these two dogs because that's one of the things that if he, if the, if you have working dogs that can protect your, your livestock, um, that if a bear or a mountain lion comes, um, they might survive. <laughs> That's the goal. But the working dogs shouldn't be treated like your pets. Like they should be treated like working dogs. So anyways, I went over there, I met the two new working dogs and she just has her playful, but it was just so much fun. It was just really relaxing. And so basically all weekend, I didn't work much. I had a lot of friend time this week. I get a lot of family time. Uh, one of my nieces is promoting from junior high to high school. And so I'm going to get to go to that. Um, and yeah, I'm just, so I get the air conditioner, which I'm, so the air conditioner, just to put things in perspective. So a mini split unit, if you don't know what it is, basically it is, if you, if it's a ductless air conditioning system. So I have an A-frame with no attic, no crawl space, just there's, Inside, really, really, can you go play with Luna, your friend, and drive her nuts? No? Were you just driving her nuts and she got over it? Um, <laughs> uh, so anyways, I don't have any space to run a duck system in the A-frame roof line. I'm on a cement slab, so there's no crawl space under my house and you see my hands moving and you think I'm playing a game, but I'm not. Um, so a mini split is a ductless air conditioner system that has usually an outdoor unit that usually goes on the ground. And then there's one or two or three indoor units. And they're kind of like a rectangle, you know, like rectangle this. And just to put things in perspective, so one of them hopefully will go right there if they can make it work. Um, it might have to go over there, but we're really pushing for right here. And one will go in my loft and one will go in my bedroom. So this bedroom won't get its own because it'll be close to that one. And that's also my office and guest room and usually the doors open. And so if it's a warm day, like it should, some of the cool air should be going in there. And that's a really small room anyways. So I didn't want one in there, but basically the one up in the loft will kind of help push some of the air down, like the heat down when it's winter. And this one down here will help push, basically they all work together, but you can turn one on, you can turn two on, you can turn three on or, so like, let's say if I'm sleeping at night, I'm gonna turn off the two in the main rooms because I'm in my bedroom, but I'll keep that one on. During the day, I'll turn off the one in my bedroom and I'll have these on because I'll just close that door and like, so you, you can be efficient about it. Like you don't have, it's not just turning on your whole air conditioning system and cooling all of the house, but because I'm in an A-frame and it's very high pitch, even though the square footage of the house isn't too great, they have to factor in more square footage because there's just more distance to cool upwards as well. So anyways, there's three indoor, um, I think it's Bosch. Is that <coughs> B-O-S-C-H? Is that the company? Um, I think that's the brand. So there's gonna be one outdoor unit on the ground and that'll be in the dog run area. So hopefully they don't cause any trouble. They're not, I mean, the puppy's destructive like a puppy should be, but, or, you know, most puppies are just very mouthy and don't have manners. Uh, you could sit right back here. You could come right back here, right? Um, he's just, this is our life. 
So yeah, so anyways, that is what they're installing. It's supposed to be three to four days install. They're starting, to, today's Monday. Um, they're starting Tuesday. Um, so I'm going to meet them here and when they get here and I just review and make sure we're on the same page of everything, where all the different units are going, how the outside, um, cause there's gotta be some piping that goes from the main unit outside to the inside or whatever. I just want to make sure they have an understanding of how I want it to be and how it will work. And so that I don't come home to any surprises, but then I will go and see family, hang out with them a couple days, get a little work done when they're busy. Um, and the dogs are going to go. So that's the plan this week. And then I have to go back down to LA next weekend for one day. So I'll come back here, do some shipping. Um, and that, so, cause you know, obviously I'm not changing my, you know, I'm not going on vacation mode. It's not a vacation. So I'll come back here. Hopefully they'll be done Thursday night, which will be Thursday, uh, Tuesday. I'll take my shipping Tuesday morning. I do two day ship or um, I don't ship every day. I ship every, every couple days. And so if I do my shipping on Tuesday morning, if anything sells Tuesday or Wednesday, I can ship those out on Thursday when I come home, if they aren't done. And if they do need to carry over until Friday, I can either go stay with a friend or somewhere else for one more night, but at least I can pick up some shipping and make sure that gets out. And, but hopefully they, they get it done by Thursday. And, and then I can just like be here Thursday night, get some work done Friday. And then I've got to leave again on Saturday. So it's going to be a busy week and that's, yeah. But oh, I'm so excited. We've just had these like low 80 to mid 80 days, mostly low 80s, but because all of that side of the house is windows, if it's 80 degrees outside, it's for sure going to be 80 to 85 in, inside. It just warms up a lot. And so I am like a, I could live at 75, 70 to 75 degrees year round and just never go over 75 and I would be happy. But I will keep my, I mean, I, I, I run my heater less um, when I can and I'll just like, you know, so I think it'll be interesting. I mean, I'll be, it'll be interesting to see the bills. This is my wall heater and this is gas. The air conditioners will all be electric. So it'll be interesting to see how much more I'll be paying. But I think a lot of it, you know, days I'm not here, I'll just turn them all off and I can just turn them on when I get home and, you know, be a little warm until it cools up. Um, I know that I kind of, I did ask them if it could be connected to like the nest, you know, those thermostats, like a smart thermostat. But, um, I just kind of fling him around because he is a flinger, right? Um, I know. So um, it can't. Apparently they do have an app with the system, but I was reading reviews and it didn't look that great. So we'll see. I mean, that would obviously be convenient where you could just like turn on your air before you get home. Like all my family has them and they're great. Uh, but if it doesn't, an air conditioner will be better than no air conditioner, even if it's not the fancy smart kind. Um, also his ears, I'm really interested to see what his ears do. So around this age, Luna started having an ear perk up. And I noticed this morning, one of his ears is starting to go, not all the way up, but starting to perk up a little bit, kind of like what Luna's did. So because he's a mutt, I'm interested to see what happens with his ears. Like it would be awesome if he had the same kind of ears as Luna, where she's got one, <laughs> she's got one that kind of goes up most of the time. And then one that's kind of a little more floppy. And sometimes both will go up if she's like in certain situations. Um, and sometimes both will be like down because she's scared or she knows she's in trouble type of thing. But for the most part, she's kind of an off, like one ear is different than the other. It would be awesome if his did that. I think it's like the cutest thing about mutts, some mutts. Uh, I was reading an article the other day. So I, I took him out to socialize and he had to go get a shot. And so I decided to take him out so he could like see some people and be in a different area. And then he got to meet a dog, just sniff like he wasn't on the ground. Um, and someone came up and said, oh, is he like, he, we were chatting and, oh, he's so cute. And they were dog people. And they're like, where'd you get him? And what's his deal? And, and they're like, well, what is he? And I said, oh, you know, he's just a mutt. I saw the mom, like she kind of looked like a border collie mix, but you know, who knows? And who knows what the dad was? So we were talking and she's like, well, you know, he definitely looks like he has a little border collie. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's the coloring maybe, but, 
And then I saw, he saw someone else. I took him somewhere else and he just sat in my lap while I ate and someone came out and he was like, oh, you have a little pity mix. So the funny, so the, the thing is, is that a lot of people for homeowners insurance or really any insurance, there are certain breeds that, you know, they don't allow or they won't insure you. And um, the thing about Luna is she did, she did one of those tests, like the breed tests. She's like 10 different breeds. And yes, she has some pit in her. I think most mutts do, like most true mutts, not just like mixes have some pit in them, but it's not more than 50% of what she is. And yeah, she has some dominant features, but she's a mutt and he's a mutt. And I think the hard thing is, is that people sometimes get either really scared and there's some people that just absolutely love pit bulls and, but most mutts have a little bit of them in them, a little bit of pit in them. And it'll be interesting. I'll probably do a test for him at some point. It's not urgent, but I would say his ears look a little bit. His face is also long. Come here. I know. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Okay. You want to roll over. Let's show them your, your long snout. So like if you see the profile of him, he just kind of looks like a, here, look this way. He's got a little bit longer. He doesn't have the, the shorter. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think he's got probably, I would imagine some, maybe his dad was a mix of some type, but he's just a mutt. I would assume your mom looked like a mutt. We don't know who your dad is. You're just a little mutt, right? I know, but that's it. That's my update. I need to get some more work done. Be sure to hit the thumbs up <laughs> and uh, I'm going to let him go play with Luna again. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye.